Also, as we know, is uh, Erasmus Plus, uh, helping Scotland and Wales rejoin the largest international educational programme in the world. I'm delighted we've got more than 300 people registered for this event uh, from uh, Scotland, but also well beyond as well, Wales, the rest of the UK, Europe, uh, beyond uh, our country and uh, beyond that as well. And we've got an excellent range of speakers about which I'll say a few words later on. I want to just explain a few of the organisational details as we uh, uh, for the afternoon. Uh, we do have a, a sort of a number of speakers, so we haven't got too much time for questions and answers. But we have, we do have time, and we want to make sure everyone who wants to make a comment or question has a chance to do so. The way we'll do this, uh, because uh, this is a, a seminar, is that we won't be able to take questions in verbally from the audience. But if you send in your question in the Q and A on the screen and uh, we'll put as many of the questions we'll try and group them together to the speakers so that uh, we can have as good a discussion uh, as possible um, I should say that uh, this uh, seminar is being recorded so uh, uh, please uh, uh, continue if you're happy with that if not uh, I'm afraid we can't anything about that but please uh, hope you'll be happy with that um, at the end of the entire seminar off, just after we finish you will get a survey sent from the Youth Movement in Scotland asking for your views as to how the event went. We really appreciate that kind of feedback we get because in uh, that way we can organize our future events bearing in mind what has worked and what hasn't worked in other events. And also at the end, you will have information about joining the European Movement in Scotland. And if you're interested in what we're doing, want to get involved in what we're doing, please do think about joining us and getting involved because we are an organization which is run by volunteers, very much dependent upon people's uh, uh, time and goodwill and contributions. So please think about joining us if you're interested in the European Movement in Scotland and in what we are uh, doing as an organization and of course the type of topics that we are discussing today. So that's the introductory comments and I'll move now on to the uh, speakers uh, because we have uh, a lot to go through this, this afternoon. Uh, our first speaker will be Professor Sarantan uh, Muscatelli, who is a principal of Glasgow University, one of the UK's, one of Europe's most eminent economists. He's been a senior advisor for the Scottish Government, the World Bank, European Commission, UK Government, and much more besides. The university has been the biggest higher education uh, participant in the Erasmus scheme over the years. Uh, Anton's uh, focus uh, today will be more on the national and sectoral interests rather than specifically Glasgow's interests and he was until recently the chair of the Russell Group of Universities for a three-year period. So he has obviously wide experience and interest in that uh, field as well. And uh, Anton is also very much an eminent European in every sense of the word. It's good to see you with us today. And we'll also have in the first group of speakers, Howell Kerry Jones, who is the former European Commissioner Director for Education, who led the design and implementation of Erasmus very much perhaps a uh, the person who really got Erasmus up and up and running at the European level. Uh, he led the design and implementation of Erasmus and became Director General for Employment, Social Policy and Industrial Relations. And he'll give a European perspective and also a Welsh perspective as uh, uh, Hal Kerry is now uh, based in Cardiff and uh, very much involved in uh, public life uh, in Wales uh, uh, as well. Later on, we'll have uh, Mary Senior and Rachel Sanderson. I'll say something about Mary and Rachel, and also our final uh, contributor today, uh, Julius Leifer, at a later time in the webinar. But now I'd like to welcome you, our participants, audience, to this event. And I'd like to uh, welcome, in particular, Sir Anton Muscatelli to give his uh, uh, contribution to the webinar. Anton, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for that very kind introduction, and, and to yourself and colleagues for inviting me here today virtually and indeed for organizing this uh, event um uh, let me just say to start is that it's deeply heartening not just to see that events such as this are taking place but particularly to see the number of people in attendance and, and i think it's indicative of just how important this issue is to many people in scotland and i say that quite specifically because while international exchange and openness is clearly important to all country uh, to all countries, there is an extent to which I think it is and has always been particularly important uh, for Scotland. Um, 
you know, my, my university is a medieval university and, and as far back as the 14th and 15th centuries, uh, we have written records of Scots studying in uh, other medieval universities like Krakow and Vienna, Heidelberg, Cannes, Bourges, Siena, Padua, Ferrara uh, and Orléans. So, uh, uh, you know, we have a long history of, of European uh, links here. And even after our first three universities were established in the 15th century in Scotland, it was very, it was quite usual for Scottish students to study in the major universities of Europe and return to Scotland with a, a wide array of uh, useful knowledge, which was crucial to the development of the country in the late medieval and early uh, modern era. But coming up to the modern day, because that's what we're concerned with today, we, we continue to benefit more than most, I think, from European collaborations. And, and as you said, we send more students abroad through Erasmus than any other UK nation. Uh, and of course, just as uh, important to us are the students coming to Scotland. Uh, nearly 60,000 international students from 180 countries come to study here every year. Uh, many choosing to stay uh, actually live in Scotland and make their careers here after graduation. Hugely important for a country like Scotland that has uh, traditionally suffered from demographic decline. This, uh, the EU inward migration has actually arrested that. And the direct economic advantages of that are obvious with uh, international students directly contributing uh, a net 1.94 billion to the Scottish economy. But of course, these economic considerations are probably secondary to just the incredible way in which these students enrich our campuses and our wider society. And uh, European and international students and staff are absolutely central to quite literally all of the world leading work that we undertake across our universities in Scotland. In my own university, in fields like precision medicine and quantum technologies, all of which will be uh, major planks of our economy in, in the coming years. Um, our lecture halls and seminar rooms are enriched by the diversity of our European students, offering distinct and varied perspectives, which uh, only enhance the educational experience of our students who come to us from Scotland and from across the UK. And, and the culture of our campus and our city of Glasgow would simply be unrecognizable were it not for the impact of our staff and students from uh, the European continent and, and beyond. So, so simply put, our European and international staff and students have made our university and our city of Glasgow uh, and widely, more widely Scotland what it is today. So I think a key part of attracting these talented students and staff to Scotland uh, has been the Erasmus program, I have to say. Um, I have a bit of history here since I, I was actually uh, an Erasmus coordinator at the very start of my academic career as a lecturer. I was involved in trying to establish some of these links and, uh, and over time, of course, it's built up considerably, as you said, and, and myself and colleagues from right across the higher education sector have been quite clear in, in expressing our deep regret at the decision of the UK government not to associate to Erasmus. But what specifically are we losing out on? Um, now, every year, over 2,000 students and crucially staff from Scotland take uh, part in exchange programs through, uh, through Erasmus+. Plus. I'm going to return to that point uh, around staff later because I think it's an important one. And those uh, are 2,000 people who are able to undertake a profoundly important experience, opening new doors socially and culturally, as well as academically and professional. And I'm sure many of you in the audience will either have benefited from such an experience or know somebody who, somebody who has. And for many people, it's no exaggeration to say that the opportunities offered are, are genuinely life-changing. Now, the UK government has decided not to associate. It's brought forward a replacement plan, the Turing scheme. And I want to be clear that while that scheme, the Turing scheme is not perfect, certainly not perfect, it has drawbacks in comparison with Erasmus, that I do welcome it, as does the sector as a whole. And, and we are looking forward to hearing more uh, detail from the UK government as to how it will operate in practice. And, We'll continue to engage closely with them and in the hopes of improving it and bringing it, bringing it closer to what we've been used to with Erasmus+. Plus. But for now, at least, there are several ways in which Turing could be said to be a downgrade on Erasmus. Uh, the first is a lack of reciprocity, uh, and that's to say Turing deals with students going outwards, but not inwards. And we can send students abroad, but we cannot receive students from abroad. Um, and the idea that we will lose out on the contribution of those students joining our campuses on exchange from the continent is not just deeply saddening, but the un unilateral nature of the scheme makes it much more difficult for universities to strike up those international relationships. Now, we can, of course, as universities do something about that. 
and my colleague Rachel Sanderson, uh, Vice Principal for External Relations at Glasgow, will tell you a bit more about what we're doing in that space. But you know, it means that we have to work harder to establish those bilateral partnerships. And, and unlike Erasmus, the Turing scheme doesn't include provision, as I said, for staff involvement, which I think is just as academically and culturally enriching and often helps foster relationships, which then bear fruit in terms of research breakthroughs with, with genuine social and economic implications. And I think if this pandemic, if the COVID pandemic has proven anything, is that cross-border cooperation and international academic networks are not optional extras in the modern day. They're an absolute necessity. And now is not the time to narrow our horizons, nor is it the time to limit opportunities for a generation of young people who have already had so many barriers raised to their progression during this pandemic. Now, getting this right is absolutely vital, I think, for the higher education sector in Scotland, if we are to maintain our well-deserved reputation for international excellence and teaching and research, which I think we often overlook. Um, it bears repeating that we in Scotland punch well about our weight internationally in this space. Uh, for example, with less than 0.1% of the global population, Scotland has 2% of the world's most highly cited outputs, 1% of the world's most cited, highly cited authors. Uh, and relative to the size of our population, this is better than the rest of the UK uh, by nearly a factor of two, and better than high performing countries in the EU like Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, so, and this pattern has been also seen in a number of papers uh, with international co-authors demonstrating that we have a research community that is collaborating internationally. You know, we've got 8% of the UK population, but Scotland attracts about 14% of UK research funding. It has two of the UK's 11 universities in the world top 100. And that success has been partly down to our ability to attract the very best researchers from across the world. And of course, Anything that might raise barriers, that might limit opportunities, or make us look from the outside a less open and less welcoming society could have very negative consequences indeed. But, but this point is not just important for our higher education sector, as I said, it's also crucial for the country as a whole, uh, even beyond the contribution of our international researchers, uh, and, and the, even beyond the contribution that our international researchers make to crucial growth industries for the Scottish economy, such as um, software engineering, such as financial services, such as uh, many other you know, life sciences. I mean, I've written and spoken for many years about the very specific demographic challenges which Scotland faces. As I said, for generations, Scotland's population trends would have real concern for policymakers with uh, a number of historical, economic and social factors combining to see Scotland in the unenviable position as one of the most sparsely populated countries in Europe over the years. And having a large and growing population is not simply an end in itself or something to boast about in international comparisons. It is, however, a crucial building block of economic growth, uh, the lack of which has been at least partly responsible for the historic relative underperformance of Scotland's economy. But as I said, in recent years, however, particularly with EU inward migration, Scotland has made real and sustained progress on population growth, reversing those trends which have held us back and currently it's pushed our population to, to, to record highs, currently standing at over 5.4 million. As I said, about 181, I mean, in 2015, if we take an observation from the year just before the referendum, there were 181,000 non-UK EU nationals in Scotland, accounting for 3.4% of the population and also a trend increasing that, seeing an increase in that movement. Um, and while this is slightly less than the total in the UK as a whole, these numbers have gone some, quite, some way in helping to stabilize the Scottish population. It's added significantly to our economic activity. Now, you might ask, what's that got to do with Erasmus? Uh, but for many people, Erasmus is the gateway to Scotland. For many of those 16 to 35 year olds, Erasmus was the gateway to coming here. Many uh, might come here temporarily to study, and might have to stay or return based on the experience they had here. And, and this is where, again, a lack of reciprocity in the tuning scheme might be damaging. I think as a country, we need to make a huge national effort in the aftermath of Brexit to be clear that we are an open and welcoming country to people who want to live, work and study here. So again, I feel that perhaps failure to associate with Erasmus looks like exactly the opposite. I mentioned a moment ago the idea uh, of Erasmus as a gateway to Scotland for many, and we actually have a very good example of that, which brings, um, brings us neatly to the next point I'd like to cover. 
and that is whether there might be some mechanism for Scotland and potentially Wales uh, to associate to Erasmus in our own right. Many of you will be aware of the letter of, from uh, some 150 members of the European Parliament and the President of the Commission asking to explore paths to allow Scotland and Wales to stay part of Erasmus. The letter was spearheaded by uh, Terry Reinke, who first came to Scotland as part of Erasmus and chose to, uh, to stay afterwards. Now, having returned to Germany, she is advocating on Scotland's behalf in, in Brussels, a demonstration not just of Erasmus as a gateway to Scotland, but how Erasmus can be employment, uh, important as a deployment of soft power as well. Now, the question many are asking uh, is, will those efforts, will, will they influence the Commission, the European Commission? Uh, uh, will, could there be a route to Scottish participation in Erasmus in future? Um, while it may seem like a tall order, I think the level of support demonstrated amongst members of the European Parliament was really fantastic to see. And it drew uh, on members from across the political spectrum, from the Greens, the Angela Merkel's CDU party. So at home, we know that both the Scottish and Welsh governments are actively engaged with the Commission in an effort of, to see what could be done. And while the situation is very different and in many ways unique, uh, we can see the situation with Ireland's funding for Erasmus in Northern Ireland, indicating that there might be some room for maneuver. It might be some room for innovative thinking to find a solution that might work for all parties. Now, from the perspective of my own university, if Holyrood, Westminster and Brussels were to find a way to permit Scottish participation in some form, if that's legally possible, and of course we don't know what the legal arrangements are yet, and affordable, uh, then we would be advocates for that participation. Uh, clearly that's taking us into political terrain and that's not for me, it's for politicians to determine what's possible and, and as I say, what's affordable. But, and our advocacy won't just be about what Scotland has to gain from Erasmus, but what Scotland has to offer to Erasmus. I think we have a genuinely world-class higher education sector here. I believe it's in everyone's interest that people from across the continent can have an opportunity to experience it. And our, our partner institutions on the continent gain just as much from hosting our students and staff as we do from hosting theirs. In the meantime, uh, as I said, Rachel will say a bit more later about what my own university is doing to build on our own European uh, links and networks. Um, and just to emphasize, these links are of utmost importance to us. Our university was founded more than half a millennium ago, very much in the European tradition, welcoming students from other European universities immediately after our foundation in 1451. We continue to be such an institution by nature, by design. And we will remain a bastion of excellence, of multiculturalism and of internationalism. And the contribution of our European students and colleagues will always be not only welcomed and acknowledged, but heralded as a social good in itself, which uh, I think makes our country a better and more vibrant place. So uh, that's what we are. That's what we will be the case, regardless of the political structures of whether it's we are part of Erasmus or not. It's embedded in our DNA. And I just wanted to conclude just there because uh, uh, our university was founded, as, as I said, in medieval times by a papal uh, act or decree, a papal bull in 1451. And it says the following, it says uh, that the University of Glasgow uh, would be formed, and I quote, not, not only for the advantage and the profit of the said city, but also of the indwellers and inhabitants of the whole kingdom of Scotland and the regions lying round about. Now, that 15th century language may not be the most poetic, but it shows that from the very first day, our university has been more than about the city or country in which we're based. A global university with an outward looking perspective and an open inclusive ethos committed as much as playing our part, as much to playing our part in solving the major international problems of the day as we are to being full and active citizens of Scotland. So association with Erasmus would simply empower us to play our part to the fullest it would provide more opportunities for students at home and abroad uh, to break down the barriers which stand in, can stand in the way of the academic advancement we need if we are to work together to solve some of the most pressing social, economic and environmental issues facing society today. And that's why I think it's important and that's why I think it's so important to have voices in Scotland advocating for it as possible. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, asking me to speak. We'll see what's possible, but we're certainly supportive of continuation if we can achieve it. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you much indeed, Adam. That's a, uh, a welcome tone on which to end, and we hope we can uh, help you in that process during the course of uh, this webinar, as a, as a start at least. And uh, with that, uh, we'll have a chance to questions, uh, as I said, uh, shortly, but straight over this stage to uh, Howell 
uh, Kerry Jones uh, from Wales and previously, of course, from European Commission. Powell, welcome to our webinar today. Oh. Yeah. For, for, did you hear the beginning? Uh, no, we've just uh, heard you just now. So. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, I spoke in Welsh at first to say Penhounda uh, Adioch uh, Thank you very much for this invitation, and especially to Glasgow University uh, for hosting this, uh, and for the opportunity to join Scottish friends to build the pressures to regain Erasmus. That's the way I would like to put it. Oh, but I'd like I to- interrupt, Could I interrupt just to say your camera's shot? We can't actually see you if you could perhaps okay. adjust. That's better, okay. that's better. We can see you perfectly now. Good. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, let me start uh, briefly uh, by reminding us of some of the important features of Erasmus, which I think some of us now take for granted. Uh, the keys to the originality and success of Erasmus lie in its architecture, which has remained basically the same since its foundation. There are three interlocking keys. Firstly, it was decided that Erasmus would be open to undergraduates in all disciplines, since previously the focus had only been on the interchange of foreign language teaching assistance, which had involved France, Germany, and the UK, indeed, since 1904. Uh, but prior to the launch of Erasmus in 87, we need to recall that at that time, in that period, there was 0.5% student mobility in Europe. There might have been some exceptions like Glasgow, but overall, there was very little movement. S secondly, as a condition for the award of Erasmus student grants, university authorities had to give their stamp of approval to the recognition of the periods of study spent abroad as necessary and integral to the degree qualification. This was the crucial basis of the growth in the scheme across Europe and more widely, with the creation of many joint degrees between two or more of the collaborating degree awarding institutions. These joint degrees have proved very popular to students. And there's ample evidence of the increased employability secured by Erasmus alumni in the international labor market. The third and crucial key was the award, and the principal touched on this, the award through Erasmus of thousands of grants to academic staffs and trainers to travel to reconnoiter potential partners abroad and to work together to develop the joint curricula the joint assessment conditions, which would guarantee the quality of the programs pursued. This investment in staff engagement and planning contributed vitally to the quality of the curricular preparations and to the reception of students gen and generated the growing mutual trust and many, many friendships which have underpinned Erasmus over the years. Initially, Erasmus concentrated on the interchange of undergraduate students, but it has progressively expanded this provision with the enthusiastic take up of joint master's programs through Erasmus Mundus, attracting institutions to partner from across the world. And this explosion of interest globally has been underpinned by the success of the Erasmus International Credit Transfer Scheme, which has spread like wildfire. By 2020, more than 10 million participants and thousands of institutions have been involved. And with now the increased uh, budget for Erasmus recently decided, this number is expected to reach 14 million by 2027. We are now faced with a difficult challenge to secure the reversal of the damaging UK government decision to exit from Erasmus, despite the proposals presented, not just recently, but consistently throughout the period of the Brexit negotiations, where they, where they pressed hard 
to respect their strong strategic commitment to continue participation. This difficulty, and I'm sorry to bring a negative note in immediately to our discussion, has been intensified by London's rejection of the joint presentation of the Celtic government's concerns to participate, even if England decided otherwise. You do not have the competence to enter such an agreement, was the minister's retort in writing to the First Minister of Wales on January the 19th. This is indeed a miserable decision. And I want to emphasize this point. It hits all four nations in the UK, England heavily as well, with negative impact on our education, training and youth sectors, damaging the prospects of so many of our young people. And the coincidence of this regrettable decision with the announcement of the expansion of Erasmus from 21 to 27 is especially poignant and disappointing. In December, it was confirmed that the program would triple the number of participants with all levels of education and training involved with a 24.57 billion euro budget, extending its coverage to be even more inclusive this, this time round. On an already, we have over 2,000 partnerships created each year through Erasmus with all the linked reciprocity arrangements which accompany them. The scale of this joint investment, coupled with the engagement and partnering of many other countries, has led to the global success of Erasmus as a tried and trusted system of international collaboration. The complementary national and institutional infrastructures painstakingly built up over the years, which underpin the implementation of Erasmus, have been essential to its success. And I believe uh, this is an important factor in rebutting the biased treasury argument of the costliness of Erasmus and in assessing much more broadly, as is needed, the value to the UK to be secured from investing in Erasmus. Any alternative scheme to be invented by the UK on its own will not now enjoy access to the centralized organization which Erasmus has provided with its experienced animation and technical assistance teams working with the different partners across the world. And it will certainly be difficult to secure a voluntary reciprocity, that's the word, voluntary reciprocity in what we've seen of the Turing proposal so far from institutions and governments in the rest of the world. And for the UK, it will imply working out dozens of bilateral agreements as without the official assurance providing advanced evidence of the mutual recognition of the periods of study abroad, our students will surely have less confidence to go abroad than they have currently under all forms of Erasmus. Let me now focus, since the principal has eloquently uh, spelt out uh, some of the disadvantages and drawbacks so far as the university sector is concerned, I want to focus on two other big losses which will hit us, which greatly concern me. Firstly, we will lose the huge advantages of the United Kingdom participation in both Erasmus and Horizon Research. These are the twin programs, program flagships, which together represent the largest education, training, research, development and innovation program in the world. These twins are now planned to work in close synergy in the period up to 2027. Together, they prioritize promotion of interdisciplinary teaching and research in environment related and sustainability studies so as to contribute to combating the global challenge of climate change. The brand new greening dimension, which Erasmus is now opening up, is precisely the kind of engagement needed in the United Kingdom to strengthen its actions and policies in this field. It makes absolutely no economic or policy sense to join one program, but not both. The second gaping hole we now face 
will be loss of the vocational education and training strand of Erasmus, hitting both initial and further education institutions, including apprentices and trainees. The Erasmus priority, according to raising the quality and quantity of this sector, at this time of concern about the, the skills revolution, with its lim and, uh, this sector with its limited history of international, in, internationalization of study, unlike the universities, will now be set aside. This has demonstrated very starkly to me the failure of this London government to grasp the breadth and scale of Erasmus and its strategic value to our four nations. The progressive inclusion within Erasmus of the interchange of young people has given a big boost to the youth sector across Europe most especially here in the UK, where the sector has been badly hit by cuts over the last decade. In Scotland, which celebrates this year the 40th anniversary of the pioneering Young Scot initiative, this will be especially unwelcome news. Across Europe and more widely, the chance for young people to participate in the European Solidarity Corps came like a breath of fresh air offering the chance for them to work on projects abroad, individually or in teams, to engage on social or humanitarian projects. And the decision in December to allocate 1 billion euros to this exceptional scheme as part of Erasmus will allow participation of up to 350,000 young people from the EU and partner countries in the period up to 27. Young people from the UK will be now denied this opportunity. The First Minister of Wales recently described the loss of Erasmus to young people as cultural barbarism. He, he, made, he has made a couple of very passionate speeches about it. Wantonly forfeiting our participation in this proven worldwide program, partnered effectively across the globe, seems to me a very curious way for this government to build its dream of a global Britain. We together need now to stand firm in our opposition to such unnecessary butchery and mobilize others to join us together with the Welsh and Scottish governments to press for a change of policy and to regain all the benefits of Erasmus. Thank you. Well, thank you much indeed, uh, Hal, uh, for those uh, uh, highlights of all when we talk about Erasmus, we're talking about much more than uh, some people think about and uh, emphasise how much we have uh, perhaps uh, lost as well. Now, we are going to have a Q&A session at this stage, and we'll come back to uh, other speakers after that. And I can see from the Q&A box, we have a, a number of questions. Um, what I'll perhaps invite our speakers uh, and to have a look at, first of all, there are a number of questions about um, can uh, Scotland join Erasmus even if the UK decides to leave this programme? Um, do the speakers have any views on the statement which was reported uh, in which it was said that the European Commission had said that only countries uh, could join, quotes, only countries, close quotes, could join the Erasmus programme? Uh, and uh, what about the example of uh, Northern Ireland where the Irish uh, government is extending, as I understand it, Erasmus membership to residents in Northern Ireland. I want to, um, Anton or Hal, do you uh, want to say anything in response uh, to any of those uh, queries at this stage? Well, <clears throat> just a few words. I mean, this is an old story. Only member states are recognised in terms of the composition of the European Union. Uh, uh, so it was it was uh, sad in a way that the word countries was used. I think that the word country was entirely wrong. What we're talking about here is the member state. And we have seen now uh, that the, uh, the government in London has already uh, given a signal that it uh, doesn't agree at all that uh, Wales and Scotland could do something special on their own. And certainly uh, I believe they would be extremely difficult uh, uh, a negative in any discussions with the European Commission in Brussels. I don't see any optimistic view that I could, uh, that I could uh, try to present to you this afternoon on that point. 
Anton, you. Well, not nothing much to add. Uh, I will. I think you're you're absolutely right. I think the if we if if the regulations that are as they're currently stipulated, uh, as I understand them, carry over as they are, then it's impossible. I think, and this is I suspect what's at the heart, obviously, of the of the uh, the MEPs attempt to sort of uh, lobby the Commission to change the terms of. Uh, of uh, the Erasmus regulations going forward into the next phase of Erasmus Plus. So I, I think that's what it is. I, I'm not an expert, I should say. I'm, I'm certainly not a European law expert, so I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask. But I think that will be the biggest barrier, how, how the regulations are drawn up. I, I think I've got an observation, but uh, I see one of the contributions of the Q&A comes from David Gao, who's one of our European Movement Twitter members, who's very knowledgeable about European affairs, been involved in a long time, and he makes the point that although the EU's full, full position may be that Scotland and Wales cannot rejoin, he points out Brussels can be very adept at uh, funding, uh, funding flexible and finding flexible solution. For example, he points out that Erasmus Mundus allows the reasons to participate. And uh, I did notice if in reading the uh, Commission's statement, but what was actually, what actually said was that uh, in general, uh, only countries uh, can join. So uh, perhaps there's a uh, room there. Well, I, I think I probably would, uh, well, I certainly would accept that in uh, practical terms, it would be difficult for Scott to join alone if a UK government didn't agree to it. But obviously that's something we might want to campaign on. Um, Mark, can I make a point about Erasmus Mundus? Because uh, I, there was a question about that as well. And it's an important question. We actually ran a, run a lot of collaborative Erasmus Mundus um, um, programs in Glasgow, and Rachel may say a bit more about this, but our understanding from those is that certainly uh, third countries are able to participate and, and they're funded differently. So, I mean, we would still plan to, to certainly participate and we coordinate a number of these uh, collaborative masters um, going forward. So uh, we don't think that participation, in, rather non-participation, non-association in Erasmus Plus would prevent us from continuing to be involved in Erasmus Mundus. But as I say, Rachel may pick this up later. Okay, thank you. I, so Howell, please go ahead, yes. Well, I'm not arguing against uh, not continuing uh, to lobby, especially the European Parliament and the other uh, European institutions. Uh, the more this is on the agenda, uh, they are very sensitive uh, uh, on the continent about it, as uh, Principal said earlier. I think uh, uh, all I've heard is great regret uh, at all levels about uh, the loss of Erasmus from their perspective, uh, let alone their anxiety about uh, what it signifies uh, uh, to the United Kingdom and our loss here. Um, so there, there may be some flexibility somewhere to be teased out uh, and the European Parliament has got some some powers of initiative in relation to the budget and other things. So it, it's, it's worth continuing. But let me, let me just uh, recall, Erasmus Bundus, of course, only touches the university end of the equation, which is, you know, the whole of the vocational education and training sector, the youth sector, these won't be touched by that. And from what I, what I know uh, of, of the take up on, in those areas, the, 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 the English organizations, particularly in the youth sector, have been very active. So there'll be a lot of regret about that. Uh, that's why uh, at this stage of this, uh, of this difficult process, I, I'm of the view that we need to get a change in parliament at Westminster. It, we need to have a much fuller debate around the issues. A lot of people don't understand the motivations behind touring. They don't understand the one directional thrust of that program, which the principal has already uh, criticized very gently, but he's spelt out very clearly the danger of losing all the inflow of students and staff into the campuses of this country, economically, socially, and culturally for the, for the, for the coming period. So I think we, we, we need to keep the arguments uh, fully fleshed out to keep the pressure on for the, for the, for the government to, to be invited to rethink. And there are ways to do this. I mean, as I understand it, I, I'll just spend one second on this. As I understand it, the decision has been made within the treaty
to have access to the Horizon Research Program. That will also require having a special protocol, which is not yet there, as I understand it, in, in the treaty. All I'm asking for is for a further protocol to be added with specific reference to Erasmus alongside Horizon, because they are twin programs. They need to go together. There's every reason for that synergy. And that's the argument that should be had in Parliament in the interest of the United Kingdom as a whole. Now, I see there's a couple of comments, in fact, or questions in a QA and a uh, about um, uh, what the universe is doing across the UK on this. I, and maybe, Anthony, I don't know if you want to comment on that. There's a, a comment, why are the Russell universities, indeed all UK universities, not rising up to point out the area of losing Erasmus? And uh, what is UK, mm. uh, universities UK doing about it? I don't know if you want to comment or not on, on those, uh, those uh, two, two questions. Well, I mean, I think it's, uh, I mean, the, the universities in, across the UK, the Russell Group and the UK more widely have absolutely pointed out the, the, the issues that the benefits of Erasmus compared to some of the issues around Turing. I think that the, the, the clear difficulty we have is that Turing has been proposed and the government has said, UK government rather, has said we will not associate with Erasmus. When, as you would expect, many English universities have basically said, well, that's it. We will try to improve Turing, but you know, the decision is final. Um, can I pick up on a point that uh, Howell made? Because I think it's really, really important uh, what he says about the integration of the European research area and the European uh, uh, educational area. He's absolutely right about that. You know, um, over time, we will find that with the European Universities Initiative, which of course is funded out of Erasmus+, Plus, although uh, as Rachel will point out, we are working with, with, with those associations. Um, you know, that will integrate much more with the research area over time. And, and, and it's gonna, um, personally, I'm convinced that over time, this inconsistency that he points out will become more and more uh, um, pointed and there will need to be a, a, a need to address it. That uh, perhaps uh, gives me an opportunity to uh, look at a, another question going beyond the university sector, um, which is a question I'll read out and present in advance, uh, a question about the impact on schools and school children. And the questioner points out, and I'll read it, but Erasmus Plus has provided opportunities to thousands of school children to, to participate in multinational projects across the Europe. A maturing scheme won't replicate this. Access to funded in-service training for school staff has also been lost. In addition, uh, she says e-twinning has not been mentioned at all in the discussion about Erasmus plus the future schemes. There were approximately 30,000 UK teachers registered with the scheme, uh, which came to an abrupt end in the middle of the school year at the end of 31st December, possibly half a million young people involved in the programme through their teachers being involved. What can be done, the question asked, to, to gain access to a programme with a scope of e-twinning which engages young people aged 3 to 18 in schools. E-twinning is open to school, e-twinning plus is open to countries which are not part of the Erasmus programme. I don't know if uh, either of you feel able to answer the question, but it, it, it seems to me an important question and an important opportunity. Um, Anton, are you able to add anything on that or is that not really in your well, area? Not, not, not much else. Not much else. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the details. I do know, as, as has been pointed out, that this was a big, this is a big loss, uh, which will not be replicated by the Turing scheme. So it is a big area where, you know, collaborations with schools, collaborations with colleges was a big feature of, of, our, of Erasmus Plus. And it's, uh, we need to find ways of making that, those collaborations work. But I, I, I'm not familiar with the details sufficiently to comment on that. How can you comment on that? Well, uh, not specifically on the e-twinning, um, but uh, the, the loss to the school systems is huge because uh, there was a big incentive through Erasmus Plus to encourage uh, schools uh, in, 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 their, in, in their educational programs to look at you know, the issue of citizenship in a global perspective. Uh, and there were many, many advantages to some of the work that was going on with, with opportunities for interchange, not just exchange, but interchange, which had previously not really been there across Europe. So it's a big loss. Uh, I'd like, to, if I could just to go back uh, to the discussion with the principal a few minutes ago, 
uh, on the on the question of the uh, the attitudes of of uh, uh, the universities throughout uh, well throughout the United Kingdom uh, faced with the loss of Erasmus, and I think I've I've been reflecting as to whether we've looked at the examples taken uh, we could take from Germany from the Nordic countries and from Holland, uh, the Netherlands in particular. It was always possible from the earliest days of Germany to have the national German scheme uh, for the export of German students, uh, which was run by an organization called the D uh, Deutsche Akademische Ausschussdienst, the DAAD. And similarly in, in the Netherlands with the NUFIC, the NOR Plus scheme, uh, in the Nordic countries, it was possible to combine having a national scheme and a national set of incentives and arrangements together with Erasmus. It wasn't either or, it was both and. And that complementarity is something I think ought, that ought to be explored in this country. There's no reason why. I mean, like the principle, to some extent, I welcome Turing. It, that's a signal that the government was willing to give give some support, limited support, and not necessarily the, the comprehensive package that was needed with inflow of students as well, but it was willing to make, make some move. And I think there's no reason why they couldn't be asked now, invited to see the, the, the case for the complementarity of Turin and and Erasmus. I think that's the profitable way to go in any, in any serious discussion. I think that's again a very helpful to have a, a positive uh, way forward. Can I also use this opportunity since you mentioned Norway and uh, um, other uh, uh, countries. Um, we have a question from uh, Ian Forrester who until recently was a, um, a judge in the Court for Justice of European Union uh, in, in Luxembourg. Uh, yeah, from the point of view from the UK, and he asks, um, what is the status of other uh, EU democracies like Norway and Iceland and Switzerland? Do their students benefit indirectly? Uh, might be worthwhile to perhaps hear a bit more about how uh, we might learn from their experience in relation to these programmes. You know, Harold or Anton, you feel able to comment on that? Yeah, no, I'm happy to comment on Switzerland uh, because, of course, that's the closest analogy to our case, where Switzerland is not a member of the either the EU or the EEA. Uh, and in Switzerland, of course, uh, is intending to associate with uh, with Erasmus Plus, which uh, I think um, illustrates a different approach. But it's also worth remembering uh, this point that when Switzerland uh, fell out of both uh, Horizon 2020 and Erasmus as a consequence of the referendum on Croatian accession, which uh, and freedom of movement, um, they temporarily fell out. They tried to set up their own um, research and uh, uh, and exchange schemes, and it, the exchange scheme didn't really get off the ground because it was really difficult to reproduce anything on the scale of Erasmus. So, I mean that that illustrates Switzerland's uh, recent uh, recent experience. But to answer Ian's point, uh, they benefit directly because they're planning to associate. Okay. No, I, well, I don't have anything well, to add on that point. Okay, well, I think uh, this now brings us to the end of this uh, part of the webinar. Uh, I, we'll have a further Q&A session later on, which we hope uh, uh, Anton Howe might be able to participate in as well, different than all the other speakers. But we'll now move on to our next uh, two speakers. And thank you again to Anton and Howe for your contribution so far. Our two speakers are now of Mary Senior, who is the official in Scotland for the University and Colleges Union, the uh, trade union of, uh, uh, of university staff and colleges staff uh, since 2009. And she's also been the president of the Scottish Trade Union uh, Congress uh, since uh, November, 2020. Uh, and she's had two decades of working with the trade union movement in Scotland, obviously knowing it well, both inside the university sector and beyond. And the second speaker will be Rachel Sanderson, who is a vice principal at External Relations in Glasgow University. And she'll focus more on the specifics uh, of Glasgow University in terms of how it'll be affected by the change and what steps uh, the university is taking in terms of 
forming its own European partnerships and networks. And obviously, Glasgow is very important for us in Scotland, but also a good example and some good ideas for hopefully the rest of the, uh, uh, of the UK as well. But uh, with those two uh, brief introductory comments, I'd now like to ask Mary to speak even after that, Rachel. Mary, welcome to our webinar today. Okay, um, thank you very much, Mark, um, and thank you to the European Movement for hosting this afternoon's event and for inviting the Scottish Trade Union Congress to participate. Um, only last week, I was chairing a meeting of three of the trade union centres from across these islands. So we had the Wales TUC, the STUC, and the Northern Irish Committee of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. And we were talking about COVID, we were talking fair work, and we were talking Brexit. So Erasmus was one of the key issues for debate with all trade union centres recognising the value of the programme to education, to schools, colleges, universities and skills development and cultural exchanges across our islands. Indeed, when I was preparing for um, this afternoon's meeting, I was talking to my now retired school teacher parents about their experiences of the exchange programme. Um, as a primary school teacher 20 years ago, my dad visited a school in Denmark, and then he hosted teachers from seven different countries back in his Middle England primary school, exchanging ideas, expertise and cultures, really enriching the curricula of the pupils from all of these different places. In 2014, um, now retired and a school governor, my mom visited Greece, where she was shocked at the poverty of the school and the area in which it was situated, but it was bursting with ideas, creativity and culture. And this was such a valuable exchange experience for all the schools involved. But then Brexit came along and has turned this international education opportunity on its head. And I think the UK's Brexit story is a grim one. We've had four years of uncertainty, chaos, crisis and division only replaced at the top of the agenda by a global health pandemic, which has accentuated the need for international cooperation. I think Brexit's exposed a democratic deficit within the UK, along with the recklessness of the ruling Tory party and the populist far right. Brexit's been a platform to power for the Tory right, for Rees Mogg, Johnson and their acolytes, enabling them to fulfil their own self-serving political ambitions but it didn't have to be this way. Back in 2016, the STUC opposed Brexit. We saw the threat to workers' rights, consumer protections, the environment, along with the rise of xenophobia and racism. The 52 to 48% vote to leave, where Scotland, London, Northern Ireland voted to remain, was never a mandate for a hard Brexit. It could have been so different, the Leave campaign never had a plan, so Theresa May, if you remember her, should have negotiated a deal which protected workers' rights, our key industries, environmental standards, as well as keeping the UK aligned and accessible for people and goods. And I think negotiating a trade deal in the middle of the COVID-19 global pandemic was always going to be risky, made worse now by a Prime Minister with no attention to detail and the cavalier incompetence of Johnson. Publishing that final deal at 3 p.m. on a Christmas Eve has only compounded the lack of scrutiny. And I'm sure the UK fisheries minister wasn't the only one too busy to read it, regrettable as that is for our fishing communities. The so-called parliamentary vote on that Twixmas day was no democratic choice at all. And so the prime minister decided his Christmas gift to us all was to ditch Erasmus. I think this is particularly frustrating sitting here in Scotland, which rejected Brexit and embraced Erasmus, along with the variety of other EU programmes and initiatives. Um, Johnson attempts to portray Erasmus as a middle class perk. And I think we need to challenge that unfair perception. As we've heard um, from Anton, it's true that university students could and did participate. And I think we should be proud that at Edinburgh University, we had the highest number of students participating in Erasmus from any UK university. But let's also remember that City of Glasgow College had 190 students and 30 staff 
participating a year by 2019 and was aiming to increase the number by 5% year on year. So as we're hearing, Erasmus isn't just for university students, it's for college students, adult learners, staff, apprentices and school exchanges too. At a time when opportunities for young people have stopped dead, the prospect of continuing in Erasmus could give so much hope. Thousands of overseas students came to the UK via Erasmus too, and the Prime Minister's claim that the scheme is too expensive fails to recognise the input these individuals bring to our society, culture and local economies too. EU and international students and staff want to come to live, study and work in the UK. And we should remind the European Commission that their Erasmus programme can be richer by including Scotland and Wales and that opportunity to live and study here. Now, on Saturday, we saw a few more details of the UK government's replacement Turing scheme, as has already been, been mentioned. I think, regrettably, it seems that scheme is based on treating international students as cash cows. And with a budget of £110 million, it's £83 million less than the UK was receiving from, from Erasmus. And, mo most, and most frustratingly and inevitably with Brexit, as has already been mentioned, it's a one-way scheme. In stark contrast, Erasmus is reciprocal. Erasmus supports staff, students and apprenticeship mobility. It nurtures knowledge exchange. It contributes to that outward looking collaborative approach, which makes our universities and colleges so successful. It's clear that the UK government's half hearted attempt to match Erasmus falls well short. So we do need to keep up the pressure upon our devolved governments and the European Union to enable Scotland and Wales to continue to participate. So what should we do? Well, I think it's vital that we remember, as does the European Commission, that education and skills are devolved matters for Scotland and Wales. And I think we need to build on the letter of our own ministers, Richard Lockhead and Kirsty Williams, to enable us to address the democratic deficit that our denial of Erasmus participation brings. We've got elections on the horizon in May, in both the Scottish Parliament and in the Welsh Assembly. And whilst our political parties are not short of uh, priorities, I think we should be demanding that they include the commitment to work to rejoin Erasmus in their manifestos. And I think electoral support for such policies only highlights the incongruity of the Prime Minister's decision and builds our case before the European Commission. I think we also need to replicate the collaborative approach of our devolved governments and I'd like to see if we can develop a Civic Scotland Pan Wales approach, bringing together social partners to strengthen our case. I'm sure that working with Anton and University Scotland, along with the NUS, we can get an STUC, universities, colleges, students, and hopefully an employers and parents associations alliance to encompass our simple but powerful demand to allow Scotland to access Erasmus. And let's see if we can do that together with civil society in Wales too. And I think we should use the power of the European Parliament. We may no longer have our own elective representatives making our case, but as has already been mentioned, it seems we have a lot of friends in the Parliament who do value the educational and knowledge exchange and skills exchanges with Scotland and Wales. Let's support them in our campaigns on the ground here too. Education doesn't observe national borders or geographic boundaries. I think education is about breaking down barriers and tackling inequality. It's about empowering individuals and communities. So education isn't about being insular or turning in our, on ourselves. Our schools, colleges and universities are stronger and more vibrant because of the diversity that comes with welcoming students, staff, ideas and knowledge from elsewhere. So I think it's really important that those educational and skills opportunities continue for young people, for teachers, for academics and for others. So we need to work together and demonstrate that this is an issue that does unite Scotland and Wales and make our case in our devolved context and in Europe to be part of Erasmus once again. So thank you.
Well done. Question B, Mary. Uh, and again, we'll have questions uh, for Mary as part of the group shortly. But now uh, over to Rachel Sanderson from uh, Glasgow University again. Rachel, welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, firstly, I would just like to echo my thanks to European Movement for organizing today's event and to my fellow panelists for their insightful comments, which I will try to not simply repeat. However, um, I would like to start by reinforcing the importance of mobility and exchange as key components in forging international partnerships, in strengthening connectivity and export opportunities, and in creating and sustaining a new generation of globally mobile citizens. If the pandemic has shown us anything, it is that it has never been more mission critical for the higher education sector to engage in collaborative international endeavor. And across the Scottish higher education sector, almost 3000 students benefited from outward mobility for study or work through Erasmus in 2017-18. And it, it goes without saying, this opportunity is vitally important to our student community and has been shown to directly contribute to graduate outcomes. In Scotland, between 2014 and 2018, Erasmus Plus funded 17 strategic partnerships in higher education to the value of 50.2 million euros and 5.4 million euros, respectively. If I turn my attention to Glasgow, um, at Glasgow since 2014, over two and a half thousand Erasmus students have joined study programmes at the university. And we have sent over 3,000 students overseas for Erasmus study and work placement, but also for international study opportunities, summer schools and taster visits. And the latter of which has been pivotal in encouraging students from disadvantaged backgrounds to broaden their horizons and spend time within Europe often leaving Scotland for the very first time as a result. A similar number of our staff, approximately 3,000, have also benefited from a period of time spent overseas under Erasmus+, Plus, sharing professional best practice and supporting increased numbers of joint and dual degrees, as well as co-authored research publications, all of which has contributed to the standing of Scotland's universities globally. As a university, we have received almost 10 million euros since 2014 for Erasmus and international credit mobility, bringing huge benefits both to the university and our wider communities in the local region. And as Huel said at the beginning, these benefits are not just economic, but social and cultural also. Through Erasmus Plus, we have had the opportunity to enrich our campuses and create a multicultural, multinational learning environment for all of our students, whilst also enhancing Scotland's reputation and visibility overseas. Our incoming Erasmus students have become alums of our universities, and Scotland has also benefited hugely from having this soft power in Europe. It's therefore enormously disappointing that the UK will no longer associate to Erasmus Plus. And the first iteration of Turing sadly doesn't replicate all of the opportunities contained within Erasmus, which of course has now almost doubled in size to 25 billion euros for 2021-27. And this is money that doesn't just fund opportunities in universities, but has, as has already been pointed out, supports FE colleges, schools and community activities as well. Now, there is ongoing discussions to ensure that a multi-annual contribution to Turing is made and that match funding is sought to help support reciprocal exchange. But I think the lack of clarity over this and the fact that Turing, at least for now, will only facilitate outward mobility is a huge blow to the sector. The sector is also clear that Turing will need to be sufficiently flexible to allow universities to choose short term as well as longer term mobilities for students and to explore the opportunities for coil learning and virtual mobility. Lastly, Turing does not, as has already been mentioned, support any staff exchange, which will mean opportunities for both individual and partnership development will also be greatly reduced. I should say that the University of Glasgow's position has been unequivocal throughout the last four years. We remain a proudly European university that will continue to support meaningful bilateral exchanges with European partners, as well as continue to explore new opportunities for European engagement. And I just wanted to say a little bit about how we plan on doing this over the course of the next few years. Firstly, uh, we are 
proud founding members of the Guild of European Research Intensive Universities. And we have recently become associate members of two European University Alliances, Neurotech EU and CIVIS. In CIVIS, we have become the ninth university member of an alliance focused on civic engagement, uniting efforts and experiences of its members to develop a, univer a European university with strong links to its local social and geographical environment and an orientation toward global challenges. Um, uniquely, it brings together a community of almost 400,000 students and over 55,000 staff, with each service member actively contributing to the social, cultural and economic dynamism of their ecosystem to promote European values such as inclusiveness, gender equality, non-discrimination and social equity. There are five civis hubs closely connected to major societal challenges and linked specifically to the sustainable development goals. Health, cities, territories and mobilities, digital and technolo technological transformation, climate, environment and energy and society, culture and heritage. Each hub will offer joint study programmes at bachelor's, master's and PhD levels at each of the civis members un universities and will foster multidisciplinary research projects through innovative pedagogies. As a member of CIVIS, the University of Glasgow is committed to forging even richer interactions and co-creation of knowledge and skills with citizens, schools, enterprises, and social and cultural associations, and providing new and unique opportunities for our students, staff, and local community. I also wanted to highlight um, our European Centre for Advanced Studies, or ECAS, which was established in 2019 as an independent research institution jointly formed by the universities of Glasgow and Lufana in Lüneburg, Germany. The centre provides researchers from both institutions a platform to develop and carry out joint research and study programmes, as well as to pursue commercial and industrial engagement with a focus on interdisciplinarity. It also facilitates, importantly, engagement with universities across Lower Saxony and Scotland, and has already benefited from generous support of the Lower Saxon Ministry. It would also be important for me just to flag, as Anton has already mentioned, the, Im the importance of Erasmus Mundus to joint master's degrees, where the University of Glasgow is either a lead or a contributing partner. These are prestigious integrated international study programs and the University of Glasgow is involved in nine of these. And it is certainly our expectation now and hope that we will continue to be able to lead and participate in the Erasmus Mundus joint master's degree programs um, irrespective of the UK's association to Erasmus+. Plus. I should say across the sector as a whole, we are continuing to engage with the Scottish government around both Erasmus+, Plus and Turing, but also really importantly on mechanisms to support future European engagement, sector-wide campaigns, and the expansion of the Saltire Scholarship Scheme to support European talent choosing Scotland's institutions for their academic studies. We are also setting up um, and re-establishing bilateral agreements with many of our partners. Um, this will take time and effort, but we are committed to undertaking this. And one of the things that I will say is that I've been hugely heartened by the support that we have received from European partners who are still hugely keen to engage uh, with Scottish universities, but also universities uh, across the UK. So we're now undertaking a number of different discussions to try and establish whether we can facilitate bilateral exchange through those partnerships. So just lastly, I want to say that the University of Glasgow will continue to explore opportunities for collaborative research, joint learning and teaching initiatives and staff and student ability with partners across Europe and beyond, whilst continuing to develop existing partnerships and support our significant community of around 5,000 European students and staff here in Glasgow. We look forward to a future of European partnership and collaborative endeavour. And as Anton has already said, being European is in our DNA and we will continue to be open, inclusive and internationally engaged for the benefit of all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. And again, uh, that's a positive note on which to end. And uh, we hope that uh, today's uh, seminar will also help uh, stimulate uh, moves to uh, allowing you to uh, get some of the benefits that Erasmus has brought as well. So that's uh, very much part of a theme for ourselves today. Now we do have a lot of 
uh, questions uh, and comments in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, a lot are uh, more comments than questions. And if you're watching this, I'd invite you to uh, have a look uh, through the Q&A and you'll get some of the views that are being expressed there. I'm going to highlight a few of the uh, comments and I would invite uh, not just uh, Mary and Rachel, but also Anton and Howard to comment as they wish uh, at some stage when I, as I go through them in groups. So just uh, taking a lot of the questions are highlighting the points that already have been made about the fact that Erasmus wasn't just to do with university students, it was to do with um, schools, youth groups, staff, European Solidarity Corps, workers, much more than, than some people imagine. So those points are made uh, very much, very powerfully in the Q&A. Uh, a couple of uh, comments which uh, I think I would want to uh, highlight. We've got a comment from Douglas uh, Chapman uh, uh, MP, who has mentioned, uh, who points out how I mentioned MPs maintaining pressure on UK government. And he, Douglas is an SNP MP, but he points out that many MPs across party are concerned about Erasmus being withdrawn and Turing seemed limited, uh, especially in the areas where support was given to youth, et cetera. And he's asking us to get in touch with him after this meeting. And I'm sure we will do so, uh, as he indicates many colleagues uh, the cross party be willing to seek common ground about this um, welcome. A comment about UK students requiring competence in foreign languages, which uh, uh, I will leave for anyone who wishes to comment on that. Um, again, um, and mentioning European um, Solidarity Corps, there's a couple of comments about Horizon Europe, and uh, I think it might be helpful just to clarify what how far universities will still be able to participate in Horizon Europe. So perhaps I could, uh, there was also a question about the, whether the departure from Erasmus poses any threat to the longer term mutual recognition and qualification. So there's a few areas there, which I would invite our speakers to comment if they wish. Does this have an impact on the, the longer term, on the mutual recognition of qualification, allowing UK citizens to work in the EU and vice, and vice versa? Uh, the issue about horizon and, uh, and what that will, uh, how that will go in the uh, uh, future and um, other comments, which I'll invite to uh, speak to comment if they wish. So can I invite any of our speakers who wish to comment to uh, on any of those points or anything else which any of other speakers have said, uh, please to take the opportunity to do so now. So Mary. Well can I comment on the, the point around foreign languages? Because I don't think that's necessarily an issue related to Erasmus, although clearly it is so important. But I guess one of the concerns, and I guess this is a concern bringing my sort of day job hat from the University and College Union, is, um, you know, the funding in our sectors doesn't readily effectively support um, the teaching and research related to foreign um, language learning. Um, and, and I, you know, so that's maybe a point more for, for the Scottish government, but, but also, um, you know, governments across the piece, because um, the way they fund higher education, it, it doesn't make um, foreign language learning um, easy. And, you know, we, we know at the moment when um, everyone's under, the, under pressure and certainly the university sector is under tremendous pressure, uh, but we know that in many places, the um, disciplines in our universities that are under that pressure and, and, and are looking at cuts are all too often um, languages, which, which, is, which is clearly um, worrying if, if we are gonna continue to be um, an open outward looking um, nation. So um, as I say, that's, that's more, um, particularly in Scotland for the Scottish government, but um, you know, austerity from the UK government hasn't helped either. Anton? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Mary. This is something we need to tackle because um, actually, if you look at the throughput of uh, students uh, in Scotland wanting to study modern languages, numbers have been declining year on year. And in fact, actually, EU students have often been the ones who've come to Scottish universities to study languages. If you look at uh, the percentage of EU students as part of our modern language programs, it's been very high. So it's with with us exiting uh, Erasmus and with us and with EU students no longer being, you know, um, treated like home students domestically, that will be a real issue um, for uh, and, and we need to address it because the danger is that um, 
tutoring might end up being a scheme that's largely around anglophone countries or countries that teach in, in English. And, and uh, actually, if, if I, you know, when I speak to our students, even those who don't study languages, those who had to at least de develop a degree of language competence in order to have their exchange in Europe, they will say that that was a hugely important part of their development. It doesn't matter if it's very advanced knowledge, but being, you know, have, being multilingual, and multilingualism is a hugely important asset for this country. And I think we shouldn't lose it. Um, can I just jump in very quickly off the back of, of Anton's comment, just to flag that I think I think that's absolutely right. And one of the things that we have undertaken at Glasgow is the introduction of a, of a language strategy to really support our students in gaining those critical language skills to build confidence to spend time overseas in, in non-Western uh, universities, so particularly to support students traveling within Europe. So um, our language strategy, which we've rolled out, has been hugely successful. I mean, the, the numbers of students who are keen to gain a place to gain um, additional support in learning a language has been phenomenal. In fact, we have many more students requesting it than we actually have places that we can provide at this moment in time. But that is something that we're really keen to scale up um, and, and deliver to our full student community at Glasgow. But I, I, think, I think it also points to the fact that our students are not entering university with the requisite language skills in order to confidently travel within within Europe and that is definitely something that we we have to we have to we have to address as as universities. Now I've noticed that a couple of comments uh, are looking at some of the practicalities of EU students coming to Scotland to study um, uh, uh, in the post Brexit situation. Uh, first uh, question is about uh, what would be the immigration position uh, of EU students who come in the future to, to Scotland? Would they, where do they stand there? Um, and the second question, that perhaps I imagine it may well be Rachel may want to answer this, or I, I don't know, uh, is some uh, uncertainty about what's happening in the, at the moment of the students who are here in doing Erasmus courses and vice versa, and what happens about uh, students um, from Scotland um, in the next academic year? Are there any arrangements for, for them? I don't know, Rachel or Anton want to comment on that? I'll defer to Rachel on what's happening over the next year. I think uh, she's closer to the details of that. Um, so we have some Erasmus projects that run right up until 2023. And my understanding is that they will continue to run right up until 2023. So some of what we're delivering will continue to be delivered over the course of the next couple of years. Um, in terms of being able to support students on outgoing exchange for the next academic year, yeah, I think there's still a question mark over that. So as I understand it, um, the tutoring scheme will come into, into being. Um, there's actually a very short turnaround time for applications. Um, I think applications for tutoring are actually opening up in March. So the, the, the process is still a little bit unknown other than the British Council will be um, kind of governing Turing for at least its first year. Uh, so we're expecting some further update to come out to the sector within the next week or two to really understand what it means in terms of a process for our students applying for places in the next academic year. But um, yeah, there is still a lack of clarity over that at this moment in time. Okay, Mary, I think we're trying to say something there. Um, not really, but I guess just to echo what Rachel has said about, um, I, I just feel Brexit has been um, just a tale of um, <laughs> lack of planning, lack of detail, um, last minute decisions we, without any, any scrutiny. Um, I, one of the things, I mean, we're also very hopeful that the Scottish government is going to bring forward um, bursaries for international students to come to study in Scotland, um, which will be um, incredibly um, helpful because, you know, we do want to continue to have um, EU and international students to 
to, to come to Scotland. Um, I, I guess another concern is you know, the large number of um, EU staff who are already and have been living and working in Scotland for, for decades. And, you know, we, we need, I think we've got until the 30th of June to ensure that they've got all of their paperwork in order um, uh, until, you know, <laughs> that, 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 that they have issues in terms of being employed. If they're EU citizens and they haven't um, got the, uh, the documentation. So, um, you know, as a trade union, we've certainly been um, supporting um, our members um, and, and I know the universities who have a high number of um, EU staff have been doing what they can to ensure that uh, people are aware of um, the, these new criteria, which, yeah, feel very arbitrary when you've obviously, particularly for people who've lived here for, you know, 30 or more um, years um, without having to have additional documentation. Um, but, yeah. Mm. Hello. You, uh, you I wanted to come back to a, a very important point that uh, Mary was making. Um, I was very interested to hear uh, about the meeting uh, that uh, was held between the different TUCs of this country. Uh, I remember historically the consistently strong support uh, for Erasmus coming from the ETUC and UNICE, the Employers Federation at the European level. And I would like to think that uh, in these next, uh, this next uh, short-term period, it would be possible to build an alliance between the TUCs and the Employers Federation and the Parents Federations. And as you suggested, Mary, the Parents Association, the civil society, um, ma ma many of whom feel very, very uncomfortable and unhappy about this particular decision uh, let alone some of the other consequences for civil society flowing from, flowing from other Brexit decisions, notably in relation to the loss of the European Social Fund, some of the structural funds, which permitted lots of collaboration between the civil society at the international level. So I think that is something that should be and could be explored. Um, uh, I will certainly, I know that the there is concern and interest in Wales as well. So I, uh, I don't know who was at your meeting the other day, but I think there's scope there to build that up. It could be a powerful voice. And I, I, I would like to think that the ETUC and the, uh, the Employers Federation of the European Union could join forces to spell out the advantages that they see from, 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 from the other side of the water, if you like, with their perspectives on it as well. I think the narrative could be a common narrative, which would have a strong voice uh, in this country to see if the, that we could anyway engineer a, a change of heart, or, or let me put it like this way, yet another U-turn. Yeah, that uh, comment uh, helpfully takes me to what I think have been the final question, but we'll use on then to something else when I introduce a speaker from a young Europe movement, which is a question that do other panellists think Mary's idea of a civic Scotland working with equipment in Wales to get a change of heart is a runner? I think uh, uh, Howell has uh, commented on that. I don't know if you want to go back on that, Mary. I don't know whether, Anton or Rachel, this is something you feel you can comment on uh, or not, but perhaps you could uh, and understand you may not want to discuss, obviously, the, the, the detailed politics of the issue. Whether you put practical suggestions of how we can, as a European movement, but in association with our friends both in Scotland and Wales and elsewhere, you in the UK and across Europe, what we can do to help move this agenda forward to try and get a change of, a change of heart from the UK government. So perhaps I can invite Mary to comment if she wishes, Anton or Rachel if they wish, and then I can invite our speaker from the uh, Young European Movement uh, to close, uh, as a final, make the final comment today. So Mary. Yeah, I mean, I guess, so, I mean, Howell said, you know, I, I, we did meet um, Shavana Taj, who is the uh, General Secretary of the Wales TUC, along with a number of different affiliates were there on, um, on Thursday. And yeah, it was, I mean, it was the Irish Congress that, that, that led on, on Brexit and Erasmus was, was, was down there. So, you know, I think, I think it's an issue that um, we as trade union centres um, have a shared 
um, agenda upon. I think I think we can all see the right. benefit of Erasmus. And, and for me, I think there's that then only just a small step to us all agreeing to be able to say something together. Um, and, and I guess I know from um, talking to the National Union of, of Students um, that, you, you know, clearly it's it, it's it's on their agenda too. It, it, it's it's a priority for them. Um, and so I do think it wouldn't be too difficult to try and replicate, um, you know, the, that sort of approach. And, and to be fair, I, I do think these type of um, issues of, about our outward looking, particularly our university sector, because I guess that's the sector I'm most familiar with, that um, we've had a really strong alliance in Scotland. And um, you know, I'm often on the opposite side of the table to Anton on many things, but, you know, we've spoken on, on, on a joint platform around this sort of subject many times. Um, and I, th I think it's, in Scotland, one of the other uniting um, uh, policies has been around the, the post-study work uh, visa to enable young people to remain and work and, and indeed um, that, that's been uh, an issue that's united you know even the Tories along with SNP, Labour, uh, Green and, and Lib Dem so um, so I, you know I, I know um, maybe I'm in a this privileged position sitting here as president of the SDUC that you know I, I think it would be a, a, a good way to move forward um, you know Obviously, Anton can um, speak for himself, but you know, I'd, I'd be really keen to to talk to University of Scotland because I'm sure they would um, also, um, you know, share this this commitment. Indeed, we'd just be replicating what our Scottish government has has done jointly with the Welsh um, Assembly government. So, um, yeah, I, th I think it could be quite powerful. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'd like to see if we could take that forward. Well, thank you. I think that's very very encouraging. I think. Um, complementing, supporting uh, the positioning of the uh, uh, joint positioning of Scotland and Welsh governments is is a, is an important way forward because they are they are foundation stones to build on in in launching any campaign. Um, but I also think just to come back uh, to the role of the European movement across the United Kingdom, I think there is scope for. Uh, the beginnings of a much more vigorous focus on this example of Erasmus. It touches so many issues and is a, a, a superb example uh, which the European movement could take forward to, to campaign and link with other bodies. The, the, the kind of alliance we've just talked about, Mary, would be a natural partner for this, that common ground. And I think, uh, you know, the, the European movement has been growing uh, in its membership, as I understand it, in the, in, in the last period uh, under the impact of, of Brexit. So uh, let's go for it. I, I know there are some discussions going on uh, between the Welsh and uh, others uh, in London, and uh, I hope with you in Scotland. Let, let's, uh, let's take it further. Thanks, Hal. Anton, do you wish to comment? Or well, I don't think I could offer advice to experienced uh, people in civic society uh, and on political campaigning to either Mary or Harwell, so I will leave it there. But I, one thing I will say, actually, is as people have pointed out, I mean, it, it would be worthwhile drawing out the views, particularly of schools in England, um, colleges, those who will, of course, will be impacted. And they haven't really joined the debate. But to answer Mary's direct question, I think it's absolutely would be really good if you know NUS Scotland and STUC were to discuss this with University of Scotland, and that's the right channel, certainly in Scotland. Okay. Well, I think uh, that's uh, a good uh, point for me to move on to our next speaker. But to say a couple of things about before we do up the cam campaign and change that issues. I mean, I. Um, genuinely believe this is an area where, as Howard has said, there could be a change of uh, government heart, uh, first of all, because the full effects of the disbenefits of leaving Erasmus, as we've heard today, are ones which I don't think many people realise uh, as yet. And I think that uh, uh, that in itself gives the possibility of um, building a coalition of uh, uh, groups interested and concerned about this, both within Scotland and Wales and both across um, um, GB as well. And uh, uh, whether or not we can get that at GB level or whether or not we can get that at uh, Scottish 
uh, and Welsh level, whether or not we have a government would choose to stand in the way of what happening in Justin's Scotland to Wales. I think there's uh, a lot uh, which can be done to highlight this issue, and I'm sure we will be. We, I know we'll be doing more of this as a European movement across the UK with our friends and partners, and we'll obviously be keen to work with other organisations to uh, achieve that. So we'll certainly be wanting to uh, do more uh, on this, and also working with our colleagues in the European movement international. We are part of an international movement, not just uh, uh, within the uh, with other nations within the UK, but also across Europe as well. So it certainly helped to build friendships beyond uh, uh, the uh, uh, beyond our, our common borders uh, as well. With that, uh, I would now like to uh, introduce to say a few words the president of the Young European Movement uh, uh, in the UK, which is the youth and student section of the European Movement. They've uh, associated with us in organising this event. It's an issue which they are very keen to campaign on. Uh, and we want to support them in that. So I want to hand over to uh, Julius uh, Leiter, who is the president of Young European Movement in, uh, uh, in the UK, uh, and, and this is, uh, in Scotland, I should, I should add. Uh, and um, we look forward to hearing from you and uh, how we can support you in what you want to do on this issue, and equally um, how um, you can support this wider uh, campaign, which we want to see. Uh, Happening. So, Julius, thank you for listening uh, patiently as one of the speakers over the last hour and a half. Uh, now we'd like to hear what we can do to support you in your in your campaign. Julius. Thanks a lot, Mark, and, and welcome uh, everyone also from, from my side. Thanks a lot for this excellent webinar um, that I had the opportunity to listen to and really learn a lot about the, the history and the considerations that go on um, also from the side of the universities. Um, obviously, we as the Young European Movement, uh, we are very concerned um, about losing Erasmus. And as you can imagine, um, young people are particularly affected by that. Notably, I'm personally right now spending my Erasmus term in France. Um, and obviously, I'm unfortunately the last generation of people um, to be able to do this in a while. So I'm also personally affected. Um, we do have also within our team, within our organization, many people who went to mobility either going on Erasmus or studying uh, in Europe generally. And obviously, uh, putting a hold to this mobility is a, is a huge problem. What are we thinking of, of doing? Um, it is a really difficult time for us as organization, um, just as the European movement in Scotland, um, we also have difficulties in sort of keeping people motivated, keeping people engaged, but Erasmus is one concrete loss, um, one concrete thing where a bridge could have been built, but was destroyed by the UK government. Um, and this is something that we would like to pick up on, um, which is why we are currently in the process of developing um, our advocacy and, and public relations campaign with regards to this. Um, first of all, we have launched a project which is called the Brexit Realities um, Campaign. The Brexit Realities Campaign um, should um, interview people and feature people um, from both the UK and Europe with regards to how they perceive Brexit. We're going to have a specific edition on Erasmus um, in this campaign, and uh, we're going to basically interview people uh, with regards to their Erasmus experience, um, what they, what they, well, what their experience was when they were on their mobility, um, and uh, also what their thoughts are on, on not being able to do that any, anymore. Um, so this is something where concretely I can also invite everyone here. In the, in the webinar room. If you have been on mobility with Erasmus and you would like to get involved with that, uh, I will provide a link uh, in a second so that you can also um, take part in this. Um, a second thing that we are obviously starting is a social media campaign. Um, we would like to basically um, uh, start a, a, um, a, a, a grassroots sort of, sort of campaign where we have members and supporters and people who just support the cause, who are not maybe um, so connected with our organization or our partner organization generally, but who just want to support the Erasmus cause um, to basically um, participate in the campaign and, and share statements um, and share statements also on, on little posters, for example, posting in front of their university with a little poster um, stating um, what, what they lost and why would they want it back and so on and so forth. So this is sort of to really be powered also by the network. And then sort of the biggest and, and most interesting uh, probably branch of the, of the whole thing um, and hopefully impactful um, branch of our, of our activity would be um, the advocacy, the actual advocacy where we thought about um, one, one big thing which I'm, I'm going to put out here and I'm really, really happy on all these points to, to hear your comments and questions as well, uh, which would be um, to basically make a claim um, towards all parties um, to include Erasmus and rejoining Erasmus into their election manifesto. Um, and this can be done um, on a Scottish level, um, but this can also be done for the next UK general election. And with that, we hope to build pressure. And with that, we really hope to sort of um, 
different, be able to differentiate between those that really are pro-European and that want to build that bridge or that want to reconstruct that bridge that has been cut and those that don't. Um, so asking parties to put um, the rejoining of Erasmus into their election manifesto is one thing um, that we are um, working on. Second thing is um, collaboration events. And I think that was already hinted also um, with, with Lower Saxony. I'm just about to jump onto a call with uh, our partner organization, the Young European Federalists in Lower Saxony, um, with regards to um, a press release and an advocacy campaign towards the Lower Saxonian government. Uh, because as was hinted, um, the Lower Saxony government, federal state in Germany, has close links with Scotland. Um, and we would like to um, we would like to support their campaign on a future um, on a future educational exchange platform, which I don't have don't know the details of, but which the our lower Sax Saxonian partner section informed me about, and where they would like to obviously be on board, and we are fully happy to to support that. Um, so seeing how also regions in Europe actually have an interest in in getting the UK back into um, in or getting Scotland back into into the scheme um, is really interesting. Uh, same applies to the UK national level. Uh, we will see if we can maybe uh, do other uh, joint advocacy actions and for for the whole UK to get back. Because basically we say uh, we want to give uh, youth opportunities back to the um, to 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 young people like in Erasmus mobility. And if this is um, Scotland rejoining Erasmus in the first instance, or if this is the whole UK, whatever, it is about getting getting it back. And I'm very happy for Scotland to take the lead and maybe the UK will follow if, um, and that's the most important thing, if we manage, as was mentioned in the webinar, to change um, the current regulation. So what we are also want to work on is European advocacy. And this is why we have our European network of, of the Young European Federalists, which is Europe's biggest political youth organization, where we are going to lobby MEPs. And we are going to lobby other stakeholders to basically allow for a rejoining of, of that scheme. This is an unprecedented situation. Obviously, we didn't have the situation before that a member state would leave the EU. And we didn't have the situation before that a nation like the UK, with four nations um, included, would, um, would sort of maybe have one government like the Scottish one. Um, be interested in in rejoining the scheme. So I think for those um, for, the, for this case, it's a, it's possible to make the case to um, to basically allow for that for that possibility to happen just because of the huge loss that happened. Um, so this is something else that we're going to work on, uh, which is that European advocacy side of things um, and collaboration events with with pro European and pro Scottish uh, MEPs um, and our our partner sections across the the continent. And finally, yeah. and this is also an um, a concrete invitation, uh, maybe also to to my uh, dear panelist uh, colleague here from the from the from Glasgow University. We are interested in. Um, making a pledge campaign where we would like to get um, the National Union of Students, NUS UK, the Universities and College Union, the UCU, um, and also um, any pro-European, well, I hope mostly, mostly most universities are pro-European, but um, pro-European universities uh, in the UK um, get, get on board um, in, in, in basically amplifying our voice and in basically um, providing concrete concrete examples of what we would like to be changed. In the first instance, this will probably be a reform of the Turing scheme, but in the long run, um, our idea as EM, and again, I'm really open to feedback on this, um, is basically to make the case that the best option is Erasmus. So rather than just complaining about the loss of Erasmus, because everyone knows that we are angry with this and the universities are obviously angry with it, we can say what exactly we want in that program and then the synthesis of that would be that uh, obviously the Turing scheme can't even be reformed to replace Erasmus, uh, which we also saw in the webinar today. Um, but rather the 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 sort of logical consequence would be to re to rejoin the scheme. So if the University of Glasgow um, and if UCU um, and the National Union of Students are interested in that, um, that would be an excellent thing to do. And now I've spoken long enough, and I'm really interested in hearing your your comments and and feedback to these ideas. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Julius. I don't think we've got time to actually take direct feedback from people uh, in the webinar now, but uh, um, could you just give us your website? I'm not sure if it's on our final screen. Have you can give us your how we can contact you, and then people know how to just get in touch. If you can just, uh, of course, either send it to all participants, perhaps, or uh, to all to all those uh, taking part, or just read us if you want to. In fact, you just, just yeah, Julius has just done this in, in the chat. You sent it on the chat to anyone who wants to contact Julius. There's details there. Obviously, we can also uh, contact Julius for European movement uh, uh, in Scotland as well. So that's a very positive contribution. As someone who's uh, 
pointed out in the chat, I endorse that. Julius very much uh, giving us opportunity to see how we go forward, how we can. Yeah, very uh, good. Take uh, positive steps, and uh, one of our speakers is agreeing with you there. I'm sure the others will also, also from their uh, looks on their faces, are also uh, very keen on what you said, and will be uh, very much aware of that campaign. We now come to the end of our uh, webinar. I want to say a few words first of all again of. Uh, Thanks to all our speakers for raising excellent contributions, giving us some very interesting ideas of how we can how we can take things forward as you have moved, but also reminding uh, all of us of what we have lost by what has happened with Erasmus and uh, how we can take steps to try and ensure we do um, retain uh, some of those benefits uh, for the future uh, as well. So thank you to our speakers. Thank you to all those who've uh, joined us this evening for this uh, webinar. And as I said, I know that's uh, uh, from many, many places in Scotland and beyond. We're uh, grateful to you uh, for taking part. Thank you very much indeed for that. Number of suggestions for activity, which we'll certainly take up uh, afterwards as a, as a European movement. And so finally, I want again to ask you who participated as an audience to respond to our survey when it's sent to you. And uh, please do think about getting involved in our campaign and activity. You'll see in a minute, I hope, a screen will come up, we'll give you our contact details and you will... Um, uh, be able to hear from us and uh, even if you don't want to join us you can certainly uh, get our newsletter from our screens uh, as you can see there. So thanks Mike for your participation and all the best uh, uh, to you for the rest of the evening. Thank you much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Yes, thank you very much. Well,